right, and we're live. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Science Beyond the Sci-Fi. I'm your host, Tyler Yo, and I'm the founder of Broken Crown Games. And I'm Katie O. I'm your new co-host and science enthusiast. Uh, before we get started really quickly, I just wanted to first off say one hi to our live viewers. And for those of you that are watching this live, you can actually click on the Q&A button or just leave comments on the Google Plus page or YouTube. And if we have any additional time at the end of the show, we'll try to address any of your questions from the live audience. Other than that, um, for those of you watching this, please uh, vote a thumbs up. This is a long show, so I just wanted to say that early for those of you that can't make the full hour. Um, but give us a thumbs up or a plus one on Google+. Plus. And to catch the edited feed, which will only be 10 minutes, uh, just subscribe to our YouTube channel and you'll see it when it pops up. So with all the introductions out of the way about the show, we were wondering, have you ever thought about living on another planet? We have three really awesome guests this week uh, to explain that concept a little bit better. Our first panelist is an independent science and technology writer, as well as a former participant in the High Seas Experiment, Kate Green. Welcome to the panel, Kate. Uh, could you start off by telling us a bit about your science background and give us a little bit about what the High Seas Experiment was? Sure. Hi. It's good to be here. So, um, right, I'm a science and technology journalist, and I also write essays and short pieces for magazines, uh, including The Economist, Discover, Wired, and a few others. And um, I was lucky enough to participate in the High Seas Project, which is a simulated Mars project funded by NASA that takes place in Hawaii, the big island of Hawaii. And um, I, the, the founders of the project were looking for people who are astronaut-like in their background and their educational background, their uh, temperament, and their personalities, and, so, and also their um, experiences. And since I have a background in science, uh, physics and chemistry, um, I, I, I qualified. And then I also had the writing um, aspect as well. And so I think that they were interested in kind of having um, a, a full package there with, uh, with my background. But the High Seas Project was a really interesting project uh, looking at specifically the challenges of food systems in space um, on Mars. So the idea is what kind of food do you send uh, on a Martian mission um, because we know that astronauts tend to eat less food over time and we don't really know why and there's some thought that they get bored with the meals that they have, they're eating over and over again. So one idea is to allow astronauts to cook, to mix it up. Um, to vary their menu, especially once they're on Mars and they have gravity again and they can maybe um, make a loaf of bread or bake a cake to celebrate their landing or, you know, make a stir fry or something else. So um, that's what we explored. We looked at two different food systems, pre-prepared food and um, food that you could put together uh, using uh, freeze-dried or dehydrated uh, ingredients that you just rehydrated. So it was a four-month mission, and it wrapped up at, um, in August of 2013, and a, there was a new mission this past year, another four-month mission, and starting in October, there will be an eight-month mission, all to study um, psychological impacts of isolation and also uh, some technological systems that might potentially be on a future Mars mission. Awesome. Well... Next, we also have the founder of Blue Marble Space and a systems engineer for NASA's Ames Research Center, Sanjay Som. So could you tell us a little bit about your background, Sanjay? And uh, could you tell us a little bit about what you do for Blue Marble Space and what that is? Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Sanjay. So as Katie said, I'm an aerospace engineer and astrobiologist at the NASA Ames Research Center down in Mountain View, California. Although I work for a 501c3 nonprofit called Blue Marble Space which does a bun bunch of different activities to do science as well as to communicate science. In particular, um, we have the Blue Marble Space Institute of Science, which is our research arm that studies the relationship between the Earth system, space exploration, and the future of humanity. And also uh, science outreach is interweb. It's part of the philosophy of the organization as well. And our outreach arm, which is saganet.org, which is a, a Facebook, but with a purpose. It uh, talks about uh, astrobiology, space exploration, and a bunch of ways for the public to engage with scientists. 
And uh, so um, in, in my day job, I am a systems engineer for the Fruitfly Lab mission, which will, uh, we will launch Fruitfly, so the International Space Station, this December. And uh, I also do research in, on life in extreme environments, particularly in, uh, in hot springs. So that's me. Well, thanks for being here. And last but not least, we have the president of Brazen Ranch Productions and the host of Dr. Geek's Laboratory. You guys can find the podcast on iTunes and Dr. Geek's Laboratory's website. Um, so we have Scott Figuet. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what Dr. Geek's Lab actually is? All right. Yes, uh, I'm Dr. Scott Figuet, and Dr. Geek's Laboratory is a science fiction radio show, uh, full cast radio drama with sound effects and, and foley and all that action and adventure, but it's designed as STEM outreach. Uh, the idea is that we use science and fiction to tell science fiction. And in our three years, we've explored everything from uh, the privatization of space, flying cars, to bionics and beyond. Awesome. So thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, so first off, Kate, that high seas experiment sounded awesome and definitely in the right step towards colonizing places like Mars. But you were still here on Earth, and not to mention Hawaii, which was awesome. But would there be any kind of time lag as opposed to just calling outside in the sun and being like, hey, Mom and Dad, I'm in Hawaii? Like, How would that work if you were on Mars? Well, we definitely didn't use our cell phones to make phone calls when we were uh, doing the simulation. Uh, we had internet access, but the goal was to uh, simulate a sort of delay that you would experience on Mars. And, and the maximum delay, you know, uh, with Mars at one end of its orbit and Earth at, it, at the other is about 20 minutes. And so what we were able to test out um, was a system developed by... Um, researchers at Kennedy Space Center and uh, this is a, a sort of delayed internet server that held our emails in a buffer for 20 minutes and then held emails incoming um, for about 20 minutes. So a round trip it's a 40 minute uh, time lag just if you're sending it, um, sending an email and then getting a response immediately. So when we were communicating with mission support we had to take that into account. We had to be aware that you know the reason we're not getting these immediate responses isn't because they don't care, isn't because they're not paying attention. It's just because that we have we have this delay. So that was that was something that took a little bit of getting used to. And you can imagine that over the long haul, you really have to have an autonomous crew that can function pretty well on its own without getting um, instructions immediately from mission support. So. We called, we called the ground support crew mission support instead of mission control. Like you hear, um, you know, if you watch Apollo 13, this is mission control. You know, mission control is always talking to astronauts on the space station, and it's basically an instantaneous communication. But you can't necessarily have that level of control on Mars. So mission support just kind of supports a more autonomous crew. And so we had this internet delay uh, that was sort of uh, simulated with these email addresses, but it's actually a lot harder to do that with a uh, with the internet we have on Earth. So most of our websites are dynamic, but that just that would be broken um, if you try to if you try to simulate that on Mars. So what we ended up doing was um, toward the end of the mission, we uh, would just have a uh, kind of static internet where we would have to request a website and then it would be uploaded to Mars. It's kind of how, how we termed it. So uh, yeah, it was a little bit challenging, especially if you're used to checking Facebook or Twitter all the time. That that might be harder to do, you know. Um, people are really thinking about systems uh, for an internet on Mars, but we're not quite there yet. All right, real quick, Kate. Um, I'm not sure if you realize that, but Katie is going to be the one throwing you guys all your science questions so you can, you'll can you kind of understand the question and be ready for it. I'm the one that's really going to hit you with a curveball and kind of mess with you. So you're my first guinea pig here. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm hitting you with the sci-fi. So obviously we're getting close to the Mars simulations and um, we're getting close to possibly one day doing it in the near future. Um, so like you experienced that 20 minute delay, it's a uh, pressure that we understand and we think we can handle, um, but knowing the emotional and even technical 
challenges that we face with a 20 minute delay from Mars, how do you see that affecting when we grow further and further out? What if we have a new colony on Saturn's moon of Titan and we're trying to have a mission support based on Mars and there's such a huge communication delay there? How do you see that affecting uh, the autonomy of the crew and even the morale of the crew? It's a great question and you know some people are talking about this and one idea is just to kind of go back to the age of exploration in the early 1900s, the 1800s when there were Arctic and uh, polar explorers and these were crews who just decided to sign up for this mission and knew very well that they might not come back and knew very well that they couldn't communicate regularly with anyone back home. So those are, you just have to rethink mission support entirely and, and um, kind of entrust the crew, you know, design a mission so that this, this crew can do things as autonomously as they need to. So there's going to be a lot of rethinking. You know, we've only really had the internet for a short period of time and we've all gotten used to it, but there's been exploration for eons human exploration. We've been, we've been traveling the globe for millennia. And so I think that, uh, you know, without communication back home. So I think that we, we might actually have to kind of go back in time as we go forward and explore the solar system. Okay, so let's say now we've made it to Mars. I've read that the temperature on the surface of Mars can reach a beautiful 80 degrees like it is here in San Diego which is perfect for me, but it can also plummet down to minus 200 some odd degrees. Um, so Sanjoy, what are some of the other environmental stresses that we're going to have to overcome to start a colony? Great question. In fact, the temperature can go up to, in fact, 95, you know, if you're in the equator on a south-facing wall of a crater. But the, the atmosphere of Mars is so thin that it has no ability to retain any heat. So as soon as the sun goes over the horizon, you drop like 200 degrees. So it's, it's not great for an evening barbecue. But um, the other stresses that are important on, for humans on Mars would be, one, the gravity. So Mars is a much smaller planet, so the gravity is about a third of what we experience here on Earth. And also, because Mars is a small planet, it means that it cooled very early in its solar system in its, in, this, in its geological history, and so lost its ability to sustain a magnetic field, which protects Earth, because we have one, from the deadly solar radiation. Furthermore, Mars does not have an ozone layer that, like Earth has, and so there's no way to shield from UV. So the surface of Mars is actually baked in really dangerous radiation, so any type of biological tissue which has DNA would be really damaged really quickly. So radiation is a big problem for humans on the surface of Mars, and um, gravity is also a stress, but I think it's something that's much more able to uh, overcome than, than radiation. Temperature, I think we will have to be very cautious about it and live in a very controlled environment, but that's, that goes without saying for a Mars colony. All right, Sanjoy, time for your curveball. Um, so with respect to the sci-fi, uh, in the Broken Crown universe, um, like I believe you know, my background was kind of towards astrobiology as well. So I try to think of some ways to adapt to the dangers of space. Um, and one of the things we do in the Broken Crown universe is there's actually a very specific guidelines for how you develop or terraform a planet and um, the very first step of doing that and colonizing a planet is actually building an underground dwelling in order to kind of shield yourself from the surface conditions. Um, based on your understanding of what it's like on not just Mars but multiple planets, do you see that being likely that the very first step would be creating an underground dwelling or do you think there's another type of protective system that we could use on a surface dwelling? So yes, the answer is that we could very well live in, uh, in underground dwellings and nature has taken that, the hard step of excavation for us. So Mars is a planet that's familiar in many ways in the sense that it's volcanic rocks, it has canyons, it has volcanoes, it has dry riverbeds. So it's a, a planet that is familiar geologically. 
And so because it's so rich in volcanic rocks, there are also things that are called lava tubes, which are essentially caverns left over underground after lava has flown. And those exist on the moon as well. And so those are natural caverns that can protect um, any future colony easily from the deadly radiation. Uh, it might not do much re with regards to the temperature, but if somehow it could be sealed, then you could create an environment that's uh, independent from the harshness of the surface. And I think that would be the way to go and for broken crown uh, colonists to take advantage of. All right, thanks. I might have to steal that one. <laughs> okay, so now we have, let's say, a habitat set up on Mars. Next thing we would probably form is like a culture or some si type of society. Um, and Scott, I know that you have your podcast for Dr. Geek's Lab, which is about all sorts of geekness, which is awesome. But you also have a degree in um, archaeology. So it seems like in the past, ancient cultures and civilizations, once people were kind of out of their walking distance, they were kind of also out of sight, out of mind. But we grew. We've got roads and, you know, internet and now satellites. And everything is now kind of in our walking distance and in our sights. But the moon and Mars are still kind of just out of the public's new walking distance. Do you see our perspective on where we can reach changing in the future? That's a great question. You know, uh, I think that as a, a student of history and as an archaeologist, I can tell you that how uh, civilizations have developed seems to be consistent time and time and time again. And I see that pattern uh, repeating itself when we finally make it to, to Mars. And I, I think that, again, it will happen again, out of sight, out of mind. And uh, while it, I think everybody will be having their eye on Mars and very excited and wanting to know what's happening, I think that it will eventually kind of fade in the background and that your life here will consume you and that you'll be preoccupied with what is happening here if you're here. And if you are living on Mars, you'll become very much um, obsessed with what's going on with your daily existence there. And so the, the, the same stresses and pulls that uh, cause that out of sight, out of mind reaction for the expansion of civilizations on Earth will happen again out in space. All right. Um, that kind of threw me for a curveball. So now I'm trying to figure out how I'm adapting my sci-fi. <laughs> um, but as far as that out of sight, out of mind perspective goes, um, so obviously right now um, there's still tribes in the Amazon that really don't connect with the outside world. They never really went to that walking next to the village next door type thing. So they're still secluded. Um, and so it's happening on Earth, and even then we've got the homeless, and people, even when they are in sight, they're kind of out of mind type of thing. Um, so there's definitely, even in our society, there's groups and people that are still kind of out of sight. Um, so with respect to that, um, in our universe, we're colonizing more and more worlds in the Broken Crown universe, could you see it being realistic that um, as we grow out as a, as a species that there might be some planets that eventually get colonized and they just really never adapt to that system-wide approach? So there, right now with our current world, we have the globalized approach where a lot of countries try to work with all the other countries to improve themselves, but there's still those few that are thrown out. Um, do you see there, there being pulled out planets or pulled out colonies? Oh, that's that's a really fascinating question, and I was trying to track where you were going as you were formulating your question. I'm trying to formulate my response. Uh, I, you know, it really depends on uh, how that colony is functioning and who is there and what they have to trade. You know, if they if they need to interact in order to be self-sustaining then there will be a more of a, a desire to be part of the intergalactic neighborhood. But if they have uh, everything they need to function locally, 
there'll be less of a desire to interact. It, it, it depends on uh, really what they're going to want and need, but, you know, like you said, this, the, 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 um, ab the ability to be a part and yet be in, uh, right in the middle of everything is something that has happened throughout time, and it just you know, boggles the mind that there are people on Earth that have never interacted with modern society. You think we're everywhere, uh, and yet it still happens. So if that's possible, then sure, there could be a, uh, a moon or a colony that has sort of go gone its own way. I think it's inevitable that they'll probably want to. All right, All right, so that was the first, all those questions, the answers were great. Um, but for the viewers who are watching live, you guys can stick around. For everyone else, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Uh, we're going to focus more on colonizing more places in our solar system when we're back. Um, so don't go anywhere, and that includes you, Mom. All right, so our very, very quick break is concluded. Uh, so now we're going to be talking more about a multi-planet society. So, hey Tyler, have I ever told you about the time that I time traveled? Um, no, <laughs> you haven't. Okay, well when I was living in New York, I flew all the way to New Zealand. It was about 30, 30 hours of travel. It was ridiculous. By the time I landed, I had not only crossed the international dateline, which made me lose a day, or jump a day ahead in time, but I was full of jet lag. But the second I got off the plane, it was so beautiful that jet lag kind of just faded into the background. Um, so my first question actually is for Sanjoy. So when we start doing all this interplanetary travel, are there any other stresses that the body might come into if we are going from, say, a small planet to a bigger planet with different gravity? Yeah, absolutely, Katie. So gravity is a big issue, has a big control on the human body. In fact, modern astronauts have to be very careful about it, and that's why they do regular exercises on the International Space Station, for example, to keep their muscle and bone mass uh, up to par so that when they come back to Earth, they won't just collapse because their muscles and bones would have atrophied to the point where they won't be able to hold their own weight on Earth. But if they were on Moon and elsewhere, that would be fine. So um, if you had a colonist that was born on Mars, for example, where the atmospheric, or sorry, where the gravity is a third and what it is on Earth, or even on Titan, where it is a sixth, even more than that, almost an eighth of the gravity that's on Earth, and then they come to Earth, without any adaptation, then they would simply not be able to walk around and, and uh, be vagrant like we all are here on Earth. Um, so if we look at the Broken Crown universe, there's a lot of trade that's going to be happening, and a lot of travel between different moons, and I think if those moons include the Earth, then all those um, traders will have to be fit, like really pay close attention to their fitness level so that they can walk and, you know, haul the booth on Earth to sell their goods. And, and when they go to the other worlds, which have less gravity, you know, they have to be really, be really conscious to maintain their fitness in those other worlds, especially if they stay there for a long time. All right, uh, Sanjoy, kind of for your follow-up on that one, um, if obviously there's going to be these adaptations that our bodies have to get used to and we're trying to counteract them through exercise like they do on the International Space Station, stuff like that, over time, um, again, we're looking at, in our universe, tens of years, not just a few months or maximum a year in some months. Um, so over the course of multiple years and multiple generations, um, do you expect this to have a profound impact on the human body and the human form? Um, I know this is a little bit further out of your expertise, but based on what you do know um, of the physical conditions and environments of other planets, do you see there being adaptations like kind of like we have on Earth in the Himalayas, uh, the people that live there get used to the lower oxygen concentrations there um, and stuff like that. And then if we would go to the Himalayas because we're used to more oxygen, go up there, we kind of just pass out. Do you see um, that being a big deal or see these long-term adaptations for the human form as we go into colonizing multiple worlds? 
That's a great question. And I want to echo what Kate said earlier in that the human species is very adaptable. So I think over multiple generations, we would do fine, but there would be some changes. Um, so we are, because we live on a, on a planet that has more gravity than the other moons and planets we're talking about, we are kind of compressed and our, our body is adapted to that. And so, uh, and there's a lot of weight on our head, you know, because of all the, the weight of the atmosphere on top of us kind of pushes down. We don't even realize it. But if we lived on Mars, for example, with a lower air pressure and a lower gravity, I think over time, and I'm not sure if that's true, but I would imagine that we would become taller and lankier over multiple generations, you know, just because we don't need to uh, have the same form as we're here. We're very adapted to be living on Earth, and there's no reason why our physiology would stay the same if we lived and procreated entirely in a completely different environment. So um, I think it would very much change. Um, but, you know, the, the, the atmospheric pressure on top of Mount Everest is, is, is 30 percent than what we have on the surface. And humans have been up there and spent, you know, hours up there with, with, uh, with minimal uh, damage. Of course, they have to come down quickly because, you know, if, if you stay too long up there, you will die because of the cold and the low oxygen and the radiation also. So, um, you know, if you have your proper gear and you pay attention to the conditions, hum humanity will thrive elsewhere. Um, but, you know, playing with the imagination, looking at multiple generations, there's absolutely no reason why the human body will have to stay the same as it does here. Um, so imagine, you know, one of those, say, lanky colonists comes to visit Earth. You know, will they will to to walk around here? Yeah, I don't think so. No, they'll have really trouble. And so maybe we can assist them with some kind of robotic exoskeleton to help them move around or something. So to be good hosts. Um, so yeah, there are stresses definitely on the human body going to uh, uh, moons and planets that are different than Earth, but also for those people coming back. So uh, it's it's a it's a great thing to, to think about. Um, real quick, as another follow up on that. Scott, this one's actually going to be directed at you. If you expect our, based on the science of it all, that our form is kind of likely to change over generations uh, from planet to planet, um, do you expect there to eventually be almost planetism rather than racism? So as we start to see different human forms and stuff like that, do you expect there to be prejudice against certain planets based on the way they look? Well... Uh, unfortunately, uh, prejudice is something that is very human, and I see that probably coming uh, is something that we're going to have to deal with moving forward. I think what it will start off with as planetary pride, you know, the fact that you have a thriving colony somewhere else, uh, and you have people who are very proud. You know, I'm a, a first generation. Uh, Martian or, you know, something along those lines, uh, it will start off as something that we're very, very proud of, and then it will probably turn a little dark just because uh, human nature is that, that we tend to, uh, you know, it, 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 as sophisticated as we are, is the fact that it is the 21st century, um, the, our mindset can be a little tribal, and so it's something that we'll probably have to push up against, but it will definitely uh, encourage this idea that the colonies are separate. You know, the, ultimately it's going to come down to uh, what is your connection to the uh, home planet, to the mother planet, and if you've been uh, living on Mars your entire life and you've got three or four generations who are all Martian and now we have these physical differences that may make it difficult for you to return home, then what is home? And I, so I, I think that that's why it all start off. I mean, it won't. It, I, I would hope that it doesn't start off as a negative prejudice, but I think that it will definitely be a factor we have to deal with. Okay, so for all of this interplanetary travel, what kind of passport am I going to need? What kind of money are we going to have? Am I going to have to learn all of these new exchange rates? Scott, can you help me out? Are we going to? Does it look like, at least, we would have more of a unified monetary system like the Euro transformed Europe? Or do you think we will break down back into all these different little localized um, currencies? What a great question. And I think it builds upon Tyler's last one, really. I think that we'll start with a unified currency because we all came from Earth. Uh, but as the civilizations on these other 
planets and moons uh, develop, then I think that uh, you know, with uh, money comes taxation, with taxation comes representation, and so you, you'll really have to ask yourself, am I being represented by Earth? I mean, how how much does Earth have in common with me if I'm you know dealing with the the trials and tribulations of living on Mars? And history has shown that as as that separation happens, the desire to be separate and independent happens, and I, and so. I could see where we start off with something very unified, and there could be a push and pull for uh, an independent currency. You know, it really kind of comes down to, you know, we're talking about civilizations. We're not talking about a group of scientists going to Mars for 18 months, and they've got a mission to do, and their home and heart are, is with Earth. We're talking about, you know, centuries from now when we have civilizations who are thinking themselves as Martian. It makes sense that they probably want their own passport or their own currency, especially if they can't get back to Earth or if coming back to Earth requires them using some sort of special gear to be able to accommodate Earth's atmosphere. All right. Um, I actually love that answer. <laughs> um, and with that said, though, if you expect us to, as a society, slowly start breaking up into our individual colonies and planets. Um, would you expect something kind of like the UN to eventually form where, um, in again, in the science fiction of the Broken Crown universe, I created, I kind of expected something similar. So I created something called UPBOK, the United, uh, I already forget, the Unified Planetary Bodies Oversight Council. Um, and really what, the, what it is is something very similar to the UN where each colony is represented and, um, or at least those that elect to be represented, kind of going back to my previous question where some colonies may choose to be off on their own, um, like you were saying. Um, so any colony that chooses to be represented based on their population have X amount of votes in this organization and it's mainly just a more or less a human right society almost that oversees commerce and all of that across the solar system. Do you, based on that, what you just said about everything kind of being planets starting to get localized, do you expect to see an oversight group that kind of makes sure no one country or one planet starts going off and doing something that everyone else thinks is kind of a human rights violation or something like that? Wonderful question, and you know when I think about colonizing uh, the, the the solar system, I think about it's our chance to you know get it right this time because history tends to repeat itself over and over and over again, and but it's a it's, it's a chance to uh, you know really kind of look back and say hey we're not uh, we're not Americans we're humans we're not you know I'm not from this colony I'm I'm part of the human race and. So if it's a, in a, um, a way to approach that, and if we can get people to have that perspective, then I think something like a UN-esque style or EU style uh, governing body for all of the different colonies makes a lot of sense. You know, the attitude has to be, um, we're not, uh, you know, necessarily controlling you, we're actually helping everybody uh, thrive, you know, because it's going to take everybody to get out there and so it's going to take everybody to make sure that we all survive out there. Just a quick follow-up to that. Um, so kind of like you said, it's our chance to get it right. Um, one thing that you've definitely seen in the past with human society with respect to faith is um, it's always been localized governments, and slowly we're getting away from that. Um, obviously, Europe has a whole organization for most of the European countries um, to work together, but it's still primarily individual effort. Do you see, um, kind of like we fully started to fight human rights violations and all that as a full global society, do you see there being a system-wide effort to fight dangers of space, which is something that humans as a society have kind of ignored today. Yeah, we've kind of I, ignored solar flares, ignored asteroids running in. We've never really pulled protection systems. Do you see that being something that gets identified, or is it going to be one of those 
again, localized things where you, where you say, it's not affecting me directly, and if, worst case scenario, Earth gets destroyed, at least we're still going to live here on Mars, and we'll be fine. <laughs> uh, well, there may be a little bit of that, but I think what's wonderful about the uh, the obstacles about living out in outer space is that everybody uh, has to deal with those issues. Everyone has to deal with radiation. Everyone has to deal with you know uh, asteroids and or uh, or other types of impacts, and and so therefore it's going to be easier to sell uh, a, a more of an intergalactic community on this is our our. Uh, Joint problem, I, you know. It really kind of comes down to, uh, uh, you know, will there be uh, an intergalactic internet? You know, we talked about the we mentioned earlier about the time delay between Earth and Mars and so forth. Well, as long as you, we've seen just how uh, the the rapid communication response here on Earth with the uh, Twitter and the internet and email and and so forth and status updates and everything, if that is Transplanted to the colonies as well, then it, again will be uh, what we've been building upon of the like a global neighborhood is something that will carry forward. But if we all have you know eight minute delays, twenty minute delays, you know, and everything to just to say hello, then you're building those walls back up, and so it'll depend on how how we communicate with one another, let alone let al uh, how we communicate with Earth. Wow, that was a heavy follow-up question that I did not expect, but that was really cool. Um, actually, my next question was more about the actual travel and how it's going to affect uh, our future space explorers. Because I know my favorite way to travel is to sleep until I get there. My favorite way to travel every time. But it turns out that sleep is actually another huge issue that could face um, our colony members and seriously affect them too. Uh, Kate, I read your article that you wrote for the high seas um, about sleep deprivation and how for astronauts going on long duration journeys it could become a major issue whether it's for fine motor skills or memory these are all related to sleep. So are we gonna have a solar system full of cranky sleep deprived space explorers or is there anything we can do to help our sleep cycle and get some restful sleep in space? Yeah, it's a very serious problem that uh, NASA is looking at. In fact, just recently, this past week, a study came out in um, Lancet Neurology. It's the largest sleep study on astronauts ever, uh, looking at um, 10 years' worth of data, uh, 4,000 nights of sleep, um, astronaut sleep on Earth, and then 4,200 nights of sleep in space over um, shuttle missions and ISS missions. and sleeps are really hard for astronauts uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, there's a workload that's pretty rough. Uh, there's a completely different environment uh, that you're operating within in terms of sound and, and stimuli. Uh, but there's also the problem of not having the um, sunlight cues that we have on Earth. So um, there, there's some thinking that maybe if we can simulate the sunlight, then we can help regulate circadian systems better. And there are uh, lights being tested on the ISS that do that. Um, more blue light in the morning and then uh, throughout the course of the day the lights sort of dim and shift colors as, as they might with a, a, a natural sunlit day on Earth. So um, it's crazy because even a cloudy day, I'm in San Francisco and it's kind of overcast, but the sky is still so much brighter than most office buildings lighting. And so, I mean, if you ask the question, are we going to be these sleep derived zombies in space? Well, you might also want to look at the office environment that so many people work in. But um, I think it might be tough starting out. Uh, but, you know, like we were talking about earlier, humans are adaptable and we will get used to, um, over time, the rhythms of what other, whatever planet or um, body that we're living on. So. Um, I think in the short term it might be tough and people are working on that challenge with these lighting, um, uh, developing lighting systems and there are some sort of um, pharmaceutical measures. Uh, what the study found was that uh, 
three quarters of astronauts um, on all missions at some point took sleep aids. So uh, you know that you need to you need to get your sleep and you need to get it however you can. So um, yeah, I think that it'll be tough in the short term, but over the long run, I think that we we can adapt and figure out a way to um, not be so cranky and to get the sleep we need. Um, just as a follow up to that one, uh, based on what you just said, um, the need for sleep aids and stuff like that, um, if you're on a single planet and you're kind of living most of your life there, it might be rough to adjust, but I assume you'd probably get used to it pretty quickly, or in a relative term, <laughs> quickly. Um, but when you are something like what Sanjoy was saying, when you're one of those commerce ship pilots that's maybe flying from one planet to another in space, then on one planet and trying to adjust to that planet, then flying, dealing with space, and then being on a different planet that has a completely different cycle. Um, I, I assume that would have similar issues for people. Do you see, because of that um, substance need right now, do you see that maybe being a pilot may lead to that's essentially an at-risk group for people that might have substance Abuse issues? Substance abuse issues? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, potentially that, that seems like an excellent plot point for, uh, for a science fiction story or a game. Um, right. So I would think that if you're a pilot, you're really kind of operating on your own in a lot of ways because especially traversing the long distances, you're you're creating your own environment for most of your time. You're probably not going to be spending most of your time on a planet. You're going to be in a contained ship. That um, that's that's your world. So you kind of operate by your own rules in a lot of ways. And this is something that you know we've kind of touched on a little bit. But like culture, how do cultures develop? You think of like the transport ships. There's gonna. It's not just cultures on planets, but it's within these ships as well. So there might be a sense of. Um, you know, I know what I, I know what I need best, and and I'm gonna do what I need to do to do my job. And I I could see I could see some sort of tensions arising there. Yeah. Okay. Well, I actually have one more question for everybody before we start wrapping this all up. My favorite question to ask people is what is your most exciting experience with science? Whether it's when you were getting your education or if it's some kind of program that you were part of that really solidified you as a scientist, what is your most favorite exciting experience in science? Kate, why don't you start us off? Sure, sure. Okay, so, um, well, Absolutely, the high seas experience was like top of. I mean, I couldn't have imagined anything better. You know, as a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. I imagined living in space. I would periodically ask myself, could I go on a one-way mission to Mars? If, I, if it meant that I would never see my family again, you know, I was kind of a serious kid. <laughs> and so, um, you know, as I grew up, I, I I kept asking myself that question and. The answer has changed a little bit as I've as I've gone on, and this um, high seas experience has made me realize that maybe right now I couldn't do a one way mission to Mars, and I haven't applied to the Mars One project um, that's hoping to send colonists one way, and I I think that it was such a great perspective shifting experience for me, and to be to be able to do science. And to be a part of science, like it's my data that's going out there that could potentially help future visitors to Mars. I mean, it, I just felt like, in a way, that that extended me personally um, beyond Earth's bounds, and that was just so fantastic for me. So, without a doubt, the high seas experience last year was a highlight scientifically of my life so far. Awesome, Sandra. What about you? Is there any kind of Big, exciting experience that's your favorite of all? There are a lot, but perhaps the favorite happened a few years ago when I was part of a uh, of the scientific crew on a uh, oceanographic study of hydrothermal vents. And so we're, we were working off the RV Atlantis, which is a research boat, and on it was the Alvin submersible, which is a essentially a titanium sphere with three little windows and a bit of buoyancy, but not much. 
And uh, so I got to go a mile and a half down to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean inside the crater of the, so of the axial volcano to study the hydrothermal vents. And I'm telling you, it's probably the closest I'll ever be to be on another planet and inside a spaceship. Because, you know, we were down on the seafloor for eight hours looking at these gorgeous hydrothermal vents and it was a bunch of you know, living animals that I'd never seen before. And, you know, being a geologist, you know, I was like probably seeing land on Earth that had not been seen by anyone before and probably never will be again in the future. And it was, you know, you could recognize the rocks because you have the training in geology. And that was, yeah, you're breathing like lower levels of oxygen to make sure that you don't get a short circuit. You know, you have CO2 scrubbers and you're, you're th with three people in a vessel that's, I don't know, like three meters in diameter, four meters in diameter. So it's really small, really cramped. And, um, yeah, it felt like I was on another planet. So that's probably the highlight so far. <laughs> and what about you, Scott? Is there anything major that is your favorite of all? Oh, sure. Well, we uh, Dr. Geek's Laboratory, as I mentioned, was, is a radio show, but we do appearances, and sometimes it's the full cast, and sometimes it's just myself. And, and I was at a science fiction convention, and we're talking about what we covered in our first year, and we're talking about the privatization of outer space. And this little boy, about uh, eight years old, kept asking all these questions and getting really detailed. Uh, and uh, afterwards, his mom came up to me and said, oh, I apologize for my son. And I said, oh, don't, please. You know, he asked some great questions. And she said, yeah, you know, I, I haven't heard him talk about anything other than his video game in months. Uh, this was fantastic. And, you know, she said, you know, you're, you're, you're this generation's Bill Nye. And I kind of chuckled and went, okay, thank you. Uh, but it was, you know, I always remember that moment because... Uh, it's it's always fun to to geek out with people at conventions and stuff like that and and, and all that sort of thing. But when you get uh, the interest and the attention of someone so young and that have them be so engaged, it, you know, you're like, oh wow, I think I'm onto something. I, I think this might actually work out. I think I might actually be doing the STEM outreach I hope to be doing. All right, real quick, um, I've got one question from our audience. Sanjoy, I'm going to focus this one towards you since it's a little bit more geared towards the physical conditions. Um, the question is from Mary. She asks, after a couple of generations of being citizens of other planets, would we all become just one color? One what? Sorry? One, one color. I assume one skin color. Ah, so that brings an interesting question, like, because, um, you know, the, the colonists that get to go to other planets probably come from space-faring space nations, you know, who have typically one race or the other. So um, I hope that it would be a multiple ethnicity that will represent humanity in the, in future colonies, and so some of the one of the most amazing things about being human is that the diversity we have in cultures, in ethnicity, in religion, and I hope that could be maintained in maintained in these other colonies. Now, if it's just one nation, one culture, one race that becomes a dominant species, then I'm, I almost want to say, unfortunately, we'll, they will become one color. But I don't think that's going to happen. You know, we're, hopefully we'll be smart enough to have a diverse set of uh, of, of uh, humans be the those colonists. So uh, um, my am, my optimistic answer is a no. All right. Uh, if I could ask one follow up based off Mary's question. Um, so let's assume worst case scenario of what you just mentioned, and for some reason, maybe down the line or whatever, one ethnicity and culture takes over the solar system more or less. Um, would you not? still expect, based on what we've already said in this program, to eventually see multiple ethnicities begin to crop up per planet just based on the amount of light radiation you get as you get further out in the solar system away from the sun? Oh, I think that's inevitable. If you have um, future humans that stay exclusively on Mars and some others that stay exclusively on Titan and some that stay exclusively where else humanity will go, and they stay over multiple generations, Darwinian evolution will take place to adapt their bodies to their local environment. So it's undoubtedly that we'll, we'll create new race if we, uh, you know, if we stay for multiple generations and give the biology its chance to evolve, for sure. All right. Uh, 
right. Um, well, I believe that pretty much wraps up everything we wanted to cover in this episode of Science Beyond the Sci-Fi. Uh, before we go, uh, could everyone just quickly kind of tell us, tell our audience how they could learn a little bit more about you guys if they wanted to look into your work? Um, so, Kate, could you start us off to let us know maybe your Twitter handle and where people could see some of your work? Sure. Um, I tweet at K Green, K G R E E N E, and um, I have a website at kategreen.net, K A T E G R E E N E.net. All right. Uh, Sanjoy. Uh, so, I tweet at Sanjoy Marcel. Uh, Sandra is my first name, Marcel is my middle name, and uh, you can find my activities on the Blue Marble Space website, bmsis.org, and the best, way, best place to find me actually is on SaganNet at saganet.org, S-A-G-A-N-E-T.org. Hope you'll join also, by the way. <laughs> All right, and Scott. And Dr. Geek's laboratory. So go to drgeeklab.com, and our Twitter handle is at drgeeklab, and our Facebook page is at drgeeklab. So it's a branding. Uh, but yeah, please. And you can find us uh, in iTunes under Dr. Geek's Laboratory Podcast. All right, panelists, Kate, thank you all so much for Katie. Thanks for hosting. Panelists, thanks for joining. Um, if you're watching, uh, please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well as give us a quick thumbs up. Um, and Katie? <laughs> All right, yeah, if you guys have any questions for the future, don't, don't hesitate to try and get a hold of one of us. Um, that's my Instagram handle, and you can also follow me on Facebook, backslash the ridiculous KO. Um, feel free anytime you guys have a question about sci-fi or the Broken Crown universe. Maybe we'll try and create a whole topic on it if there's enough interest. Other than that, thanks for having me today. I will see you guys next month, um, second Sunday. You guys don't forget, the second Sunday of every month at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I'm Katie O, and that was Tyler O, and that was some science behind the sci-fi. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.